tell me about Consentability and your role with Ausdoc. Um, I set up Consentability in 2016, and um, at the time I was working for Australian Disability Services for the government, and I was trying to do work around sexuality and relationships, and I just wasn't able to do the, the work that I really wanted to. So I always say that I ran away, because that's, kind of, that's kind of what I did, um, to set up Consentability, which is a um, psychology practice for people with intellectual and cognitive disabilities in the area of sexuality, relationships, um, and safeguarding. Yeah, so I see individuals, I see couples, I do staff consultation and training. And for Ausdoc, I'm the sexuality and relationships advisor. So I got involved a few years ago, which was lovely. Like it, I love being here, it's, it's, it's fantastic. And I get to do some individual sessions with people. I get to do some workshops. I've also been doing some online sessions for people um, as well. What are the difficulties uh, faced by adults with CCD uh, in relation to sexuality and relationships? Oh, there's quite a few sort of obstacles for people. So for some, for a lot of people, it feels like it's quite a taboo subject. So parents and carers don't always know where to start, or they might see their the young person, even if they're an adult, they might see them as being quite childlike, and therefore they might not be necessarily you know giving them the sort of sex education. Also, people don't have the same access to sexuality and relationships education that people uh, maybe in a mainstream school, for example, might. So they get left out of things because they're not necessarily being seen as a sexual person. So, you know, their, their needs are not, aren't being sort of met in that area. People aren't opening up conversations about it. Um, people aren't asking. So, you know, if someone goes to the GP or something, they're not necessarily asking are you sexually active? Do you need contraception? Because they're assuming that they won't be. Um, and then also, you know, there might be some issues to do with particular impairments that people are having. So people might not understand capacity in the way that they would need to, capacity to consent to sexual relationships. Or people might not be as aware of what I call red flags or um, signs that they're being exploited in a friendship or relationship. People might not be aware that they're being lied to, or they might not be aware of sort of what things might mean. So if they meet someone um, and they say, oh, come back to my house for coffee, people might be quite literal and think, oh, okay, I'm being invited back for coffee. They don't necessarily know that sexual activity is being expected. Um, and also people might have low self-worth. And then if they meet someone who's showering them with love, kind of love bombing, they think that that's genuine, that they've met the one, and then they might therefore stay in a in an unhealthy relationship a lot longer than they than they should do. And they also may not be aware of what a healthy relationship is because they're not necessarily being involved in those conversations. So it's a very broad spectrum of, it of issues. <laughs> it is, and, and they can be you know hard, embarrassing topics to talk about. Absolutely. So what? How do we support adults? with an, a, a CCD to access reliable information and talk comfortably about these things? I think it's about being willing to open up the conversations. So being willing to get it wrong, because that's what I did, <laughs> you know, because I, I just realised that there is a real need. So, you know, the statistics are awful for, for people with intellectual disabilities. Some statistics suggest that around 90% of women with intellectual disabilities have been subjected to sexual abuse and two thirds of them before the age of 18. So we need to be doing something. So we need to move away from this thing, or oh, we need to protect people and not talk about it. And just, you know, we need to actually be educating people about it. They don't need to be, we're not saying that people have to be sexual, but people need to know how the world works. Um, and there's quite a lot of resources. I, I really like sort of advising people to use books or resources because particularly parents and carers, we might be having conversations that are unfamiliar. So for me personally, I grew up with a mother who was, she's passed now, but she was very Catholic, a lot of Catholic guilt, couldn't say the proper word for private parts. Um, and I, I grew up, when I, was, was, when I was an adult, I knew that I wanted people to have a different experience from that. So I'm talking in a way that is quite unfamiliar or with children even, you know, we might be talking to our children in a way that is very unfamiliar 
from our, our own background. So just being willing to give it a go, being willing to make a mistake and being willing to go back and make it right. And talking about um, parents and carers, what, what can they do? They, being willing to be open and start the conversation, what else can they do to support um, particularly adults with, in regard to sexuality and relationships? Yes, yeah, so I guess there's some differences in terms of thinking about children and, and adults. Um, in terms of um, children, I'll go, I'll go to children. Uh, so I think about my own, my own children and, and how the conversations I have with them. And I'll have a lot of conversations that are actually to do with consent, but they're not to do with sex. So um, <clears throat> from when my children were quite young, I'd have conversations about, oh, you know, that other person, that looks like it's a no. They, they look like they don't want that hug or they, they look like they don't want to play that game anymore. And I talk to them about if they're playing a game and even if it makes them really, really happy and they love it, if they can tell that the other person doesn't like it or if the other person doesn't, is saying they don't like it, they have to stop, even if it's the most fun game in the world. And that's how I talk to children about it. And then that leads to the foundations for adults or, you know, my son's a teenager now. We're not talking about games anymore. We're talking about maybe sort of physical touch. And as he's older, then it's talking about sex. Even if you're really wanting to do that, you have to stop if you know that your partner isn't isn't into it. And that's you know the uh, the, the broader spectrum about um, consent. Mm -hmm. And you you raised earlier, I guess, the issue of red flags and not sort of being aware, a lot of literals and not being aware that yes. there could be sort of um, uh, other alternative um, behind um, suggestions and things like that. What can we start young with kids in regard to those sorts of things? What can we Absolutely. what can we do? Absolutely. So even from so my my daughter's autistic. She doesn't have a CCD. She's autistic, but from when she, even when she was very very young, um, she knows the the proper names for her private parts. And I remember, I remember her when she had this little doll, and her doll had her undies off. I was like, oh, why is her undies off? She goes, she's airing her vulva. And other people might be shocked about that, but I want her to know the proper name for her private parts because we know that when children are educated um, about these things, they're also being educated about body safety and they're being educated about their boundaries. So involving children in consent and, you know, I'm gonna just changing your nappy now, or we're just gonna do this, or you know, if there's a rash on, on their bottom, for example, we don't have to touch it with our fingers, we can just look at it, talking about it, talking about um, safe and unsafe touch. I don't use the, we don't talk about good or bad touch because a bad touch can still feel good. It's about whether it's a safe or an unsafe um, touch. And boundaries around pet, like family members or, auntie so-and-so who's coming in for a big hug and kiss. Just, if our kids don't want to do that, we're gonna to have to stand up for them and say, actually, could could they do a high five or could they do something different? And we have to run the risk of our family not liking that because we need to be educating our children. So that's what I mean about doing things in an unfamiliar way. And, and starting early Starting well. early, yeah. So very much being proactive. And I think parents, don't always want to be. <laughs> and also when there's so many other things to be thinking about. But what I talk to people about is this, it doesn't have to be a big full on conversation. I'm a fan of short teachable moments. So if there's a movie or there's a show and um, I might go, oh, oh, he hugged her and she didn't look like she wanted that hug. And maybe, you know, maybe she could have done that or maybe he could have done that or, um, a while ago, my son, when my son was little, he was eating some hot chips and he burnt his tongue. He said, like, oh, my tongue really hurts. And I thought, oh, I can just have a really quick teachable moment. And I said, oh, do you know that your mouth is personal? It's not private, like your private parts, but it's personal. And people can't touch your mouth or put anything in your mouth without your permission or without a good reason, like the dentist. And he's like, oh, okay, what are we doing next, mummy? And then that's it. That's just that little conversation. But we've, you know, I'm, I'm sort of starting those little conversations here and there. But it's tucked away. Now yeah. he'll, he'll, he'll be thinking about that. Yeah. Come, mm, yeah. Mm. So yeah. starting early with um, consent, the, the proper names for things, uh, you know, teaching about the, the safe and unsafe touch. Yeah. Having books available. Having books. Yeah. 
moving to adults, what, yeah. what are some of the things we can start to do in that relationship sexuality? We'd be brave enough to start the conversation <laughs> and Again, prepare to get it wrong. books and resources, um, uh, talking about movies and shows or if people are sort of verbal and verbalising about things that are happening or, you know, so-and-so's got a girlfriend or that person or neighbour has broken up with their partner or whatever, go, oh, is that something you've ever wanted for yourself? Are you interested in anything like that? What do you know about that? Or if people are, you know, you see that they they might have been watching like a Disney movie or something and they're very caught up in the fantasy of the, the prince and the princess. Using that as a conversation about relationships and talking to people about relationships and involving, I was going to say involving people in gossip, but I, I don't mean that. But if, you know, if you've got a friend or someone and they're talking about their relationship, involving the the adult with the CCD. Like, oh, you know, someone so has got a new boyfriend. They've got a new girlfriend. It's going really well. Um, so you can start these conversations with them. And if they are expressing a desire to, to, to be involved, perhaps there is someone that they're connecting with. If, if you've got any advice about how to, to um, some practical tips about how to help them stay safe. Um, oh, yeah. So I think hopefully by then you'd have the foundation of people being open and honest with you and that they can talk about anything. Um, yeah, just sort of thinking about what a healthy relationship looks like and what it feels like. So knowing that, because sometimes people might confuse um, a part of being controlling with them loving you and it's very very different so you know thinking about talking to them about the signs of a healthy relationship that you can still see your friends you don't have your partner texting you all the time saying where are you um, you know you talk about the things that do happen in a healthy relationship and some of the things that shouldn't be happening and again I keep talking about shows and movies but they're brilliant because if you think of all the different soap operas and things there's lots of stuff happening so you can very much think about you know neighbors or home and away and whatever to be thinking actually that's quite an unhealthy relationship that shouldn't be happening you know what could that person do that's good is there anything else that we've missed that we need to talk about i think something that um i want people to know is that they can talk about pleasure <laughs> when they're talking about the sexuality in relationships because i think understandably people are very much coming from like a sort of adult safeguarding perspective which is I understand why that happens but you might have a, a young woman who's talking about her boyfriend and then people quickly go into the protection don't do anything you don't want to do and women well you know everyone is is aware of, of this and sometimes people hold back and they're not talking about how actually they they want to experience pleasure or they are experiencing pleasure so I very much talk to people about having you might have mixed feelings about a situation so that they can have the opportunity to think about what they're worried about, but also what they're wanting. And also that sex is supposed to feel good. There's a lot of people I see, and maybe because they're watching porn or they're watching different things and they're not quite sure what they're watching, they think that sex is painful or that it's supposed to hurt or it's just about one person and their pleasure. So I very much kind of um, counteract that and say it's actually supposed to feel good and consent goes throughout and you can change your mind. Even if you start off and you're enjoying it and you change your mind, you have every right to say no and it has to stop. Yeah. Thanks, Natasha. You're welcome.